All right, I am so excited. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> welcome to the stage lights. Um, to welcome our panelists um, to kick off a conversation with all of you. Um, and before I do a brief introduction of the panelists themselves, I wanted to just add another quick thanks because I think Jordan Fitch is back in the house uh, to producer Jordan Fitch and is Cedar back now? Downstairs again, rats. Um, I meant to mention that Cedar was one of the filmmakers as well um, from the Shorts collection. So, oh, there's Jordan. Okay, we'll just embarrass them over there. <laughs> um, and I also forgot to thank um, our supporters, which include King Arthur Baking Company with support from Vermont Humanities and uh, Vermont Public as our media sponsor for this event today. But to the meat of the matter, um, I am uh, thrilled to first introduce my partner in moderation, Jennifer Byrne, the end there, from the white, River Natural Resource Conservation District. Yes. Um, and we've had the chance to partner with them on a couple of things over the last couple of years, including uh, the agroforestry tour, um, which was featured. Um, next to her, Johanna Evans, who's my partner in film crime over the years at White River Indie Films and uh, was one of the producers involved in the last film. Um, Farm Free or Die, which I meant to remind everybody that was just an excerpt of the complete film. And if you'd like to see the whole thing, it also has a lot of educational materials associated, which Johanna might mention as well. But uh, Johanna has been um, a film manager at The Hop and is um, has been on the board of White River Indie Films for a long time. I'm doing really brief intros because I just want to get to hear what you guys have to say. Um, Andal Sundaram Murthy. How'd I do? Okay. Um, <laughs> Excited to introduce one of the uh, featured climate farmers from the farmer story downstairs who's been farming in New England for a little over 20 years, I think, but just got your own farm three years ago, Nala Farm in Wilmot, New Hampshire. Um, and then uh, Teresa Ong, who uh, we just had the chance to meet, and I think you just flew in from Europe like five minutes ago. <laughs> Thank you for being here. We're thrilled you made it in time. Um, and she has like the coolest title, she's an agroecologist, is that correct? I wanna be that when I grow up. Um, and an assistant professor of environmental studies at Dartmouth College and the founder of Ong Lab. Um, and um, I don't, do you have a direct connection to any one of these films? Okay, save those thoughts till I give you the microphone. I just, okay, so connected to all of the films, and then I'm gonna give it back to you in just a second. Um, that's awesome. And then um, Fran Miller to my uh, left, who um, was featured in the first film, you saw that. So Center for Agriculture and Food Systems at Vermont Law and Graduate School. Um, and I think what Jennifer and I are gonna do is just kind of tag team on a couple of questions to get it started, but please make sure that you're preparing yours. Um, so, um, Jennifer, do you want to kick off and ask the oh. first? Well, yeah, I was, I was going along, I was tracking with all the films to the last film because it went really hard on into carbon markets. I don't want to start there, but oh my gosh. Um, if you care about the people of the Brazil, you would be staunchly against carbon markets. It's enclosure, it's deforestation, or not deforestation, but murder, genocide, really. Um, they, they, you know, the Brazilians touched on beef having impact, but yeah, Brazil this year is the number top exporter of corn now, uh, beat the United States for the first time this year. And the carbon markets are chasing people off their land um, and it's coming here. So I, I mean, since we just ended on that note, <laughs> have you, how are you all thinking about um, carbon markets and do you agree with uh, the film, the prior film, you know, that it's a false solution? Where, where are your thoughts on, on these markets as they're starting to emerge? And I should have mentioned we are recording this, so I'm going to pass the microphone so we can really hear what you're saying. Would anybody like to jump into that first? I'll say. So um, I'll just say I'm a simple farmer and I think I think pretty simply about things, and if something is too complicated to simply understand, it's probably a lie. Yes. That's the way I look at things. <laughs> you know, if you see a 
somewhere it says, save money by spending money. That doesn't make any sense. So I think if you just look at how people are farming and it looks destructive, it, it probably is. And the idea, I think the Farming Well Black um, film said it pretty correctly that when people can pay to pollute, it's just going to be rich people who can pollute and the rest of us who have to pick up the tab. So um, anyway. So um, I'd like to provide a little context for the film Farm for Your Die. Um, the nonprofit that created the film American Resilience Project is an operation that is trying to pass um, climate friendly and forward looking legislation by appealing to people on the center right. So the film has a very particular agenda in, in that regard. It is, it is definitely not addressing the concerns of marginalized people. It, there are, there's a lot of things that the film is overlooking, but some of that is by design. You'll notice that a lot of the farmers who are interviewed are white guys from Nebraska and Tennessee and Maryland and more red leaning states. The idea is the 2023 Farm Bill, which um, was supposed to uh, come up for discussion <laughs> at the end of September and then now we don't have a House Speaker, uh, so we'll see whether that gets passed by the end of the year as it's supposed to. The main agenda for the film was trying to get incentives for farmers for regenerative agriculture practices. The carbon markets is something that appeals to people on the center right. So it is definitely a pragmatic choice to uh, put that out there as, hey, this is, this is something that's going to make farms in your district, in your red areas, more prosperous. It's, this is something that is going to lead to food security. There's a section of the film that you haven't, haven't seen yet that deals with national security issues related to farming. And so, yes, I will, I will admit that the film does not address the downsides of carbon markets at all. But, um, but I hope you can appreciate some aspect of that pragmatic agenda. That's really helpful context. I wondered if Teresa or Fran wanted to respond to that question. I agree with both of you. <laughs> I think um, what Jennifer's saying is really important and what Leah Peniman said in the film is really important about who gets to pollute. And the farmers from Tennessee and Nebraska and others in the Midwest, they farm a lot of land in this country. And for them to take up cover cropping and regenerative ag, I don't really know that what they're doing is regenerative, as was stated in the film that focused on indigenous practices, the animated film. I don't think they think about workers. I don't think they think about pesticides. I don't think they think about a lot of things. And if there is a way to get them to change some of their practices, it could be a slightly positive thing. I will put it like that. That was really well said, I think. Uh, it's very difficult for me to think about, you know, whether we can envision a future where that is the solution to all of the collective problems we face in food systems, whether it's a component or a trigger for change in a larger social movement, that's another question completely, I think. And in any, as many ways as we can get people to align more with one another, I think it's good. But understanding that that is not the solution is very important, I think. So one of the things Jennifer and I decided was I would focus on the storytelling. My question um, is really about the power of and the choices of storytelling in the medium of film. Um, I found this a very intense juxtaposition of filmmaking styles in a really positive way um, that I was curious how you all responded to. And maybe more specifically, were there moments that were kind of 
transformative for you? Were there any moments where an idea or a possibility or a vision landed for you because of storytelling? Or on the contrary, I, I think, you know, as the first question brought up, you know, were there moments where you reacted in a way where you felt the, f the storytelling of the filmmaker was maybe misrepresenting information or uh, misguided? Um, and as you each respond to that, um, I think keeping in mind the context of who the intended audience of a film, you know, that's an open question. Um, so would anybody like to respond to the... And you might choose an individual film or respond to them as a group. Thank you. Thank you, Andal. I'm not trying to make a go in order or anything, but um, I was really bewildered by the rabbit hunting, rabbit hunter movie. Um, I thought it was fascinating. I just, I was like, where is this? What is such a window into a totally different life? Um, I love films that challenge me that way. And yeah, you feel really challenged not to judge people because, you know, seeing that immediately you're like, what? <laughs> I don't know if that's the most intelligent response, but that one definitely kind of shocked me and in a good way. Um, <clears throat> I will say for me, so I'm an agroecologist and I think agroecologist as a term is sometimes less understood in the US context. <laughs> but agroecology uh, is defined as a science practice and movement for creating more sustainable food systems. Um, and I think for me what was really, I don't know, eye-opening in this series and also the event in general is every single film defined regenerative agriculture and owned regenerative agriculture in its own distinct way. And I thought that was very telling as someone who studies food systems and people and like environments and how people construct these food systems and what they think of them. I think that this series of films really showcases that people define these systems and those definitions can be very different and important. I was really struck by the first film, um, in part because Kiss the Ground actually helped us develop our film, which wrapped in, I'm gonna say, like January of 2022. And it's amazing to see how much movement there is in this conversation, how quickly we are progressing. And it's really great to see that, you know, what, seemed progressive a year ago of like, we're gonna push regenerative agriculture on farmers in the US and this is gonna start a movement that's gonna save us, that a year later we're already seeing, no, that's not it, that's not enough. We actually, it's, it's, a, it's a mindset. It's not, it's not about the numbers as much as it was. And so it was really encouraging seeing all these films and just seeing like, oh wow, you know, this, People are really getting excited about this and, and getting excited about the heart of the story. Um, I, I love the animated film narrated by the indigenous woman and we're a little bit in the bubble here in Vermont um, in terms of farming and agroecology and using sustainable practices and not to say that isn't happening in many places around the country, but it feels more here. Um, but that film uh, touched my spirit in a certain kind of way. Uh, and it was so holistic. And um, I love that. I love that you love that. <laughs> um, did you have another question you want to ask, Jennifer? Um, sure. So uh, thinking across the films and whether you're involved in the particular film or not, were there specific, you know, they touch on certain types of regenerative practices. Um, were there specific methods and, and um, modalities of farming that um, stood out to you? And is there a connection in your mind between, or can you point out, um, you know, I work for the conservation district, so we're at the junction of policy and funding and the farmers. Um, 
are there practices or methods that you saw within these films that you see as easier, easy to attain, or are there barriers to um, farming in these regenerative ways? How, in your work, where are the barriers for you implementing some of the practices that stood out? <laughs> Thank you, Amber. Sorry if I'm talking too much. <laughs> um, I was thinking, as you were saying that, about the farmer that said, you know, if I can't, I think he said something like, if I can't make a living doing this, I'm not going to do it. So even though I kind of push back against the idea of carbon markets and stuff, you do need to be able to make money doing this, or it's never going to work. It's that, you know, triple bottom line, like, Climate change is an environmental and it's a social issue, but you can't just ask farmers to do things if they're going to go out of business. So incentivizing cover crops is a great way to just meet people where they are. I mean, even, even though I've kind of immediately was like, oh, carbon markets, I don't know. But every little movement towards doing the right thing, you know, we're all going to get, we all have to start somewhere. So, I mean, my farm is not organic, and I just haven't been trained in organic. And I think, yeah, sorry, I don't know if that's the most eloquent, but <laughs> meeting people where they are. Yeah. Because um, there are billions and billions of dollars available through the government that already incentivize, incentivizes these types of practices. So I also wonder, have you accessed any of those programs? Um, can you speak to some of like the money that already exists and the carbon markets are trying to recreate? Yeah, no, I definitely, I, I have less than an acre of land, so the money is, it's not huge amounts, but I mean, I'm working with the NRCS, so I, I do get payments for, I just entered the CSP program, which is the Conservation Stewardship Program. And yeah, I will be getting some reimbursement for cover cropping and wildlife habitat and mulching. And I just think it's such a wonderful program. I mean, nobody gets into farming to get rich. So every little bit helps. <laughs> Just to respond to your original question about like what obstacles are out there, this is this is speaking more on the national level and not necessarily locally. But um, the film d isn't just about carbon markets. Um, Farm for Your Die is about a variety of issues that farmers face um, and financial solutions that the farm bill can present. One of the big ones is that there it's very expensive to switch over your equipment to be no-till or low-till. And right now, there's really not a lot of assistance available to help farmers with those expensive equipment switches. And some of it is the companies that make the farming equipment set it up with these computer systems, not unlike your cars, probably, went from being very easy to fix to now it's all in a computer and you have to go to the dealer or whatever. It's kind of the same with, with farm equipment. And so there, the hope is that the farm bill will provide some relief for farmers who want to switch their equipment over to these more regenerative agriculture practices. There's also opportunities with the farm bill to make land easier to purchase for small farmers like Andal right now. Um, it's very difficult to start a small farm um, or to, you know, lease, you know, just five to 10 acres with a house on it if you're a family farmer. Um, but and a lot of the land is being bought up by foreign entities. And there, there are ways with the Farm Bill that we can make it easier to make a living with a small farm and not to have to go into these industrial systems that are, in many ways, the biggest part of the problem. Yeah, um, just one thing about that. Actually, land is being bought up by domestic entities in the US, pension funds, um, 
multinational corporations. Uh, Senator Cory Booker just introduced a bill called the Farmland for Farmers Act, which prohibits um, pension funds and big investment vehicles from buying up land. Because in America, it's actually not really China and Iran and those countries that are buying land, it's our domestic corporations. And that incentivizes farmers to have bad practices because it's all about profit. And so they can't spend the money to build healthy soils and that sort of thing. So anyway, just that on that point. Um, the number one barrier, I'm not a farmer, by the way. Uh, the, one of the farmers in our project is sitting here, Suzanne Long, from Luna Blue. She would know more about the barriers in the, on the practices. But one big barrier that young and beginning farmers and farmers who want to use good ecological practices have is land access. And so that's what the Land Collaborative is really trying to create a model for. There is history in our country of community land trusts owning ag land. Um, new communities in Georgia, a group of civil rights activists, that's how far it goes back. And we are really trying to continue that, build off of that model, and find a way to allow farmers who are using good practices, give them the space in which to, 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 to invent new things, to go back to Afro-Indigenous practices, to really experiment given where we are now. Um, so, get off this place. <laughs> it's really exciting to hear about all the work that's being done locally, because for me, I feel like one of the biggest issues in this night easy issue by any means is our global food system writ large and the way that it incentivizes profit over anything else. Um, so I, I feel really that our solutions are local in nature, being able to localize problems um, and create solutions at that level. And a very local solution in production here, I think, is just thinking back into the ecologies of where we are. Well, what grows here? <laughs> you know? Exactly, <laughs> trees, <laughs> trees, that's, that's all I'll say. <laughs> great, well we just had a great workshop downstairs um, with local presentation about decolonizing food waste, but I wanna give the audience an opportunity and I'm just gonna hop down and run this microphone around so that we can hear your voices. Um, would anybody like to ask any questions to our panelists? While you're thinking about that, I'm going to um, share that um, the Kiss the Ground animated film, the filmmaking team behind that is the same team behind the feature film that we're showing at seven o'clock. Um, and I have seen it and I really wanna encourage all of you to come and let everybody you know um, come because it's a beautiful film, um, really informative and inspiring. And uh, it will be preceded by uh, remarks from Lieutenant Governor uh, Zuckerman and also by live music um, uh, by a Banaki musician, Jesse Bruchak, who's come down from Burlington to be a part of our evening. In between now and then, um, at five o'clock downstairs, we're gonna have a meet and greet with the climate farmers with um, pastries from King Arthur and uh, Caribbean food from Full of Flavor. All of that is free. And then at six o'clock, speaking of community and agriculture, we'll have a square dance in the Limo Lounge behind Jam, just go through that door, um, with uh, Nils Fredlander and uh, B, uh, B Charmer, um, live music. So just come down, be, be a part of it. Has anybody thought of a question they want to ask? Okay. Just picking up on the really quick comment about trees, I wonder how much any of you think more of the solution may be getting away from annual crops that have to be continually harvested, whether it's low-till or no-till. The no-till adds a lot of chemicals in order to get through that. And perennial food systems, uh, slightly hinted at with the guild in the um, forest project, the food forest that was developing um, in the Hartford, seems like a much more integrated way to go and just wondering how much you think that may be able to happen
partly with small farms, but potentially in a larger scale. I believe strongly in the future of food, relying more on perennial crops and trees. Sorry, I have a little bit of a throat thing happening. But um, yeah, so I, I think that if we want to create more food systems, we have to move away from these annual food system models that not are just, uh, monocultures are bad for many reasons, but one of the main ones is that the annual crop systems require this annual tillage um, which disrupts the soil and it creates um, disruption from deep down into our water systems to our atmospheres, right? And so I think perennial systems have a lot of benefits in an ecological way, but it also has benefits from a social um, way. If we think about the labor that we put into our work um, tending land and growing food, I think a more sustainable future would consider perennial systems that allow you to um, sit with the land for longer periods of time and um, through that create a balance between what you take and give. Um, I'll just say that part of the NRCS program incentivizes pollinator habitat and establishing perennial, I mean, they even said they would give me money to plant blueberry bushes, so. <laughs> Again, just as long as I'm not gonna lose my business by doing the right thing, um, I mean, yeah, you have to balance that, doing the right thing, doing what's good for the environment, and doing what is socially correct. Anyway, just want to add that tidbit. Just one, one thing to note, um, there's an organization in the Midwest called the Land Institute, and they are producing grains that are perennial. They are, um, uh, one of them that they are marketing is called Kernza. Um, so there is some work being done on those kinds of, the development of crops in that way. And I'll just also mention the Midwest also has the Savannah Institute, which is focused on agroforestry, um, mostly tree crops. And so I think, yeah, there's a lot of people who are working on this issue of perennializing agriculture, but um, it also needs to be done with the social and political and economic systems in mind as well. And so that, I think, is one of the biggest barriers as well. It's just like combining both uh, the ecological and social in our food systems transformations. Um, were there other questions? Yeah. Watch me run like one of those rabbits out of the sugar cane. <laughs> um, thank you so much for being here today. Um, I was struck by the very few comments about weaning farmers off of use of pesticides um, as part of moving towards a more sustainable way of farming. Um, and there are some, as you I'm sure know, there are some exciting alternatives to pesticides coming on the market, the Rich Earth Institute in, in Vermont being one of the major sources. Um, so I'm, I, I'm interested in your take on why that aspect of regenerative agriculture wasn't mentioned more and how vital you all feel organic farming is to being able to ensure a sustainable world. I'm not a farmer, so I'm gonna hand this off to someone who is very quickly and maybe you can correct what I'm about to get wrong. But my understanding is that when there's more carbon in the soil and the plants are healthier, then there's less need for pesticides because they have a natural immune system to fight off the invasive species, bugs, whatever, that are doing damage to them. And so if the soil is healthier, the plants are healthier, and you don't need as much pesticide. But please, Andal, tell me if I'm totally wrong. Um, 
So I went to college for music. <laughs> I just want to throw that out there. <laughs> I'm not a sustainable ag major. Um, this might be a tangent and stop me if I'm talking too long. But I learned something recently that was really eye-opening, watching a documentary about British farming around World War II. This may seem unrelated, but <laughs> apparently the government took over agriculture. Like they had an administration of agriculture, and they introduced chemical farming. And they said if you didn't use chemicals, because I think at that one at that point a third, two thirds of their food was being imported, and then Germany cut them off, so they had to produce all of their food. So they had all these chemicals to farm with, um, chemical fertilizers. And they said, if you didn't farm with chemicals, they would take your farm away. So I just want to say that organic farming is what people have done for 10,000 years. And we know how to do it, but we lost our way. And I want to be an organic farmer. I just feel like. I don't want it to be forced down my throat. Like, I want to do it. I want to learn how to do it, because I just feel like we lost that generation. And I don't know for sure if, if that's exactly what happened in America as well, but I feel like we just need, we need to get back to the garden, you know? Um, I don't know if that really answers your question, but I do think it's important. I just think, yeah, baby steps. <laughs> Yeah, that was really beautiful. <laughs> so I think MST, the, the film that discussed MST is an interesting example of this landless, um, landless people's movement that started actually with people moving back onto the land and adopting a lot of conventional farming um, management techniques, including monoculture production on a large scale and in a heavy use of fertilizers and pesticides. And it was through local experiences where they had families working these fields and families including children, often without protective gear, and they were experiencing firsthand the health impacts of, of that management. Um, and MST over time started to adopt alternative methods of production, primarily because of these firsthand experiences that they faced, as well as um, the acknowledgement that they were being trapped in debt cycles where companies were, uh, where they were beholden to companies for the access to the, those pesticides and herbicides. And so in many ways, our reliance um, on food uh, our reliance on pesticides is, is manufactured, it's intentional, right? Where, um, as, as you said, like we have, as a people, been doing organic for so long, we just lost our way, but it was very much on purpose. I'm wondering if there are any other, oh, I'm sorry, it's you, Jennifer. I think it also has to be said, it doesn't, really, it doesn't really start with soil health, it really starts with biodiversity, which is why you know, reducing our toxicity in our farming system is so important. But biodiversity is what builds soil health. It, to have a biodiverse, you know, an incredible array of plants on top of the soil um, actually feeds the soil and allows for the quorum sensing that happens that allows for the microbes and the fung fungal networks to exist underground, um, which, you know, when the, when the uh, microbiome produces their little films, they make aggregates in the soil, so that's what builds soil health. Um, and I think it has to be, like, widely known, like, we have to continue to put this out there that no-till cover crop systems use more chemicals because they have to kill the cover crop and plant their plant in the ground. So. Um, just another reason why there's there's an entrenchment going on right now when we talk about you know just 
even these carbon markets for no-till systems. It's, it's entrenching monocultures. Um, so that's biodiversity is really important. Um, so our little pests. We have a question here from the subject of the film. I just thought, um, um, just to answer a little bit the question about soil health then. Um, we've been farming organically um, and for 30 some odd years. When we initially got to the farm that we're currently on, it had really been what we call take farmed. It had been hayed and hayed and hayed and hayed and nothing returned. So when we first got there, we joked because the weeds wouldn't even grow. No. <laughs> Now the weeds are really strong. <laughs> um, but um, so yes, soil health and diversity, we saw, you know, we've seen in, in terms of disease and even pests over time, you know, initially we'd have uh, certain diseases sp specifically like Altonaria uh, and other things were pretty prevalent in our in our crops did, weren't you know vigorous somewhere but um, but just you know integrating using thinking of the farm as a whole ecosystem with animals with a diversity of crops so you're really getting that biodiversity above ground and below ground you know how that has really changed just the vitality of our crops and in terms of um, less disease issues. And I would say even to a certain extent, less pest issues, although climate change is, you know, sort of changing that again, too. Um, but um, yeah, so I think, you know, trying to work with nature, with the ecological systems that are here really can make a difference in, in terms of what we need to uh, rely on as uh, external inputs, trying to keep those cycles working within the farm ecosystem. Thank you. I'm going to hop back up on stage here because I realize we are out of time. Our climate farmer meet and greet is about to start. Um, but before we close, I wanted to pull the curtain back a little bit to just share in response to some of your comments about the films that were chosen. I want to give Cedar and Alana credit um, for the curation of these films and to give a little bit of our logic in choosing particularly um, the rabbit um, Rabbit Hunt, <laughs> to get the title correct, um, but also Kiss the Ground, is that we want to offer the community diverse filmmaking and storytelling styles. And one of the things we realized in this field is that there are a lot of films that are instructional and use a very traditional documentary style of sitting people in front of a camera and interviewing them and giving an explanation and then having B-roll to illustrate a point with a goal to move you towards a certain conclusion and to think about things in a certain way. And that we wanted to encourage our community to become self-aware and circumspect about the filmmaking styles and the way they are affecting your processing of information and the way that you're learning. And we wanted to throw one in there that made you work a little harder and that was more observational um, about a community and their relationship to the land and that maybe you were going back and forth and how you felt about what was happening in the rabbit hunt at different times. Maybe you observed the industrial processes happening in the background or the characters in the foreground. Um, but that we want to stimulate just this kind of conversation and to appeal to different sensibilities and maybe uh, introduce you to something new. And then our ultimate objective, to pull the curtain back further, is to inspire you to be storytellers. Um, we're here as a community of media makers, whether podcasting is your jam or filmmaking, or if you want to do a series, if you have an event happening and you want to invite us to be a part of it, um, we could be here to help document that and make that a part of the oral history of our community and what we hope to leave behind as a legacy for future generations to know how we are struggling with this moment. So thank you all so much for being here. I encourage you to go back downstairs to the jam space, which is right next to Tucker Box, for some free cookies and Caribbean food and chat with the farmers and stick around for some dancing and more movies. Thank you. <laughs>